Hi, and welcome back to the Radio Mechanic. Today we're going to take a look at a vintage piece of Boonton test equipment, the Type 250A reactance meter. This device was built in 1953, 54 time frame, and sold for $1,250 back then. And to put that into perspective, a new Ford would cost you about $1,500 and a Chevy Bel Air with all the bells and whistles was about $1,700. So this was a fairly expensive piece of test equipment. Uh, outside the reach of most home experimenters, probably not even found in any TV lab. This would have been something owned by a university or a large company like a Tektronix or, or a Hewlett Packard. This was considered a semi-portable piece of equipment back then. It has feet on this end of the cabinet and on this end of the cabinet. It has a carry handle and weighs a mere 40 pounds. Uh, the top plate here is silver plated as are the thumb screws and the binding posts. No expense was spared on these. This unit also had available at the time an end connector adapter that would mount on here, it would mount on top of this plate and provide an end connector for 50 ohm coaxial cable. I've never seen one, I've only ever seen them in the catalogs. I looked for a long time to try to find one because having the end connector on there would have made this a lot more convenient to use. Why they settled on a 50 ohm end connector uh, is kind of a mystery to me. The military developed coaxial cable because they needed a cable they could run uh, you know out of the inside of an automobile or an airplane to an antenna system and my guess I've never been able to find out why they zeroed in on 50 ohms because you can get coax in 100 ohms 75 ohms 20 ohms you can build it to any impedance my guess is it was a good compromise between the impedance at the base of a vertical antenna which is around 32 ohms and the impedance of a dipole antenna, which is 75 ohms, the coax could have been used conveniently on either one with nothing worse than about a 1.5 to 1 VSWR. But at any rate, this one has the binding posts. We'll show you briefly how this machine operates and how it reads out reactance or impedance directly on this scale after you've selected the frequency resonated an inductor, the inductor you put up here with uh, a variable capacitor, very accurately marked, and then nulling the meter with this final dial will result in the exact reactance or impedance of the tuned circuit. Um, then we'll do a brief tear down, show you what you got for your $1,250 on the inside, and it's a fairly impressive piece of equipment on the interior. So, let's get started. The first thing we'll do is set it up and get it ready for operation. Okay, this meter was primarily designed for impedance measurements of parallel reactants. Now, the manual says here, the RX, type two, RX meter type 250A is a wide frequency range impedance meter designed to permit accurate individual determination of the equivalent parallel resistance and parallel reactance of two terminal networks and components. The instrument is completely self-contained and consists fundamentally of a refined shearing bridge circuit together with, it, with its associated oscillator, detector, amplifier, null detector, and power supply. Uh, the manual also goes on later in the back and describes how you can measure the impedance and velocity factor of coax, uh, measure capacitance, and there's about half a dozen different things you can do with it. However, they are quite cumbersome by today's standards and can be done much more quickly and easily with many, many different types of instruments you have laying around your lab today. But as a general reactance meter for measuring parallel reactants, it's still quite useful and fairly easy to operate. It would be considered fiddly today by today's standards. And let's take a look here if we can 
get a little more height without the tripod tipping over. I'm going to see if I can find something to hold it. Okay, we've moved the tripod and rearranged some stuff on the table. This all seemed a lot easier in my head when I was thinking about doing it the other night. But we'll carry on. We have here an 8.5 microhenry inductor wound on a piece of ferrite. And doing the maths, it to get this to resonate on the 6 meter handband at 51 megahertz and check its impedance, let's just assume for a minute that we wanted a uh, 50 impedance, 50 ohm impedance load at uh, 51 megahertz. We'll set the instrument up to do that experiment. And according to the numbers, we should have approximately 62 picofarad of capacitance for 51 megahertz to resonate with 8.5 microhenries and give us a 50 ohm impedance. So let's see how it works out. We've wound a couple of turns on here. This is about 8.5 uh, microhenries, and we'll see where we go. The instruction manual says first turn the instrument on and allow it to warm up for 30 minutes. And it's been sitting here on the bench for about an hour, so it's had plenty of time to warm up. Then we start by zeroing everything. We set our parallel capacitance to zero. If it's in this direction, the white numbers would mean it's uh, inductive reactance. If it's in the yellow, it means the device here is capacitive. Much like an antenna that's too short becomes capacitive and one that's too long becomes inductive. Then we set the reactance scale. You'll notice there's a sliding knob up here that follows across as we turn this. I hope it's showing up on camera. I can't tell in the viewfinder very well. We set this for infinity. We set our oscillator range. And different windows come up here for different parts of the oscillator range. We set our oscillator range on the range of 48 to 110 because we want 51 megahertz. We'll dial in 51 megahertz. Then it tells us to unbalance the bridge by putting our fingers on the terminals so that we get a reaction and peak the oscillator. So there's a knob to peak the oscillator and we're simply going for maximum output on the oscillator for the uh, best sensitivity, uh, easy for me to say, the best sensitivity on the bridge. Close enough. Then we have to balance the bridge with nothing on it. So we start with this knob here and that just about nulled most of it out. This one nulls capacitance, these null any reactants. And you go back and forth a couple of times until you get the reading just about as low as you can get it. That's not bad. We have a fairly active oscillator and our bridge is balanced. And we take our component and we mount it on the two binding posts that are on the top. And again, I wish I had the coaxial adapter for this, but I think they are made out of unobtainium. I have never seen one. Now we dial in the capacitance and see if we can get the bridge to react. And it did ever so slightly. And if this was an airbound coil, we'd have a much sharper peak at this point. But where this is wound on a ferrite core, the Q or quality factor of that coil is very, fairly low. That means our reactance or uh, the point of reactance is going to be fairly wide, fairly broad. It won't be a sharp no. I'm going to start dialing in the impedance. And now you see. The bridge is beginning to drop and we're approaching 50 ohms and that appears to be at this point almost exactly 50 ohms of reactance. Let's try, there we go, there's 43 picofarad, we're above the 40. And there's three on the white scale here, so there's 43 picofarad. We'll try dialing in the reactants again a little bit. And we've pretty much nulled the bridge. 
This is reading a reactance or impedance of 50.5 ohms. It's not at the next number would be one. It's about halfway in between. So the numbers we ran seem to work out fairly well. This is fairly close. Now we should take a look and see what some other pieces of equipment claim the impedance is. So we'll quickly take a look and see what my modern vector network analyzer says. And we'll also take a quick look and see what this MFJ impedance antenna analyzer is. It does impedance, it does VSWR. So let me get the adapter on there. Okay, I've put my inductor on top of my MFJ antenna analyzer here. Now, I had to add a capacitor here because we had capacitance in parallel with it here. So I found a capacitor that was about 43 picofarads and just soldered the inductor across it so we have a parallel resonant circuit. Then I dialed in 51 megahertz on the analyzer and you can see the reactance here is 47 ohms. That's pretty close to the 50, 51 ohms that we have on the other meter. Now there's going to be minor variations because there's capacitance just in this connector, the length of this connector, how far away I was from the top of this bridge will affect how much capacitance was in parallel. There's a lot of mitigating factors, but the difference between 51, uh, excuse me, the 47 ohms here and the 51 ohms there is really insignificant. That's very, very close. We could drop that into our circuit and have it work just fine. The VSWR difference would be almost un, uh, unmeasurable without some really fancy laboratory equipment. And in, in real life, a lot of times, this capacitor would be uh, a variable trimmer capacitor when you actually built the circuit so you could dial out any reactants that uh, wasn't correct. So we'll move over, we'll take a look at the vector network analyzer and see how it looks there. Okay, we have the capacitor and inductor mounted on the front of the vector network analyzer and please excuse the dark picture, I've had to turn the lab lights out so that the screen would show up on the camera without being all washed out with uh, overhead lighting and hopefully we're going to find an angle again there we go I think we can see what's going on here now we're going to run a sweep I have it set up to run from 45 megahertz to 55 megahertz and I have SWR turned on impedance phase turned on and impedance magnitude turned on so we'll do a quick sweep of those three parameters and as expected the red line is SWR and it's under 1.5 to 1 from 45 to 55 as I expected there was going to be a fairly flat response on this because it's wound on a ferrite and the Q is very low uh, the violet line, whoops, why didn't I get parameters come up on there? Here we go. The violet line is phase angle. If we come over here, the violet line and the green line, the green line is impedance, and the two of them at 51 megahertz just about overlap. Now this says the impedance magnitude is 46 ohms, and the phase angle is 9 degrees. So the 46 we had, uh, what, 47 for, on one instrument, 46 on this instrument, and 51 on the other. So the theory is pretty much proven out here. We're very, very, very close to the 50 ohms we expected to see. Now let's take a brief look at the inside of this and see what you got for your $1,200. Right, all the lights are back on in the lab. We've moved some stuff out of the way. And... We'll take a quick look at the insides of this unit. Now I should mention here that each and every one of these instruments was hand calibrated at the factory. And this is outlined actually in the manual. The drum that has all the numbers on it and the capacitance wheel here, these machines were individually calibrated. They would have run this thing through its limits used standards, very precision standards on the binding posts, 
and every division on here is hand engraved and looking at this wheel when I had it apart the first time to look it over inside you can still faintly see some of the pencil marks where the man who was calibrating this marked it then they hand engraved all the divisions on here and hand engraved all the numbers every one of these units is unique in other words you can't take the mechanical parts out of this and use them to replace parts in another unit it won't track correctly every single one of these was hand calibrated by a trained technician back at the Boonton factory when these machines were built now to get this top cover off a mistake a lot of people make when they get these is try to take the screws out of this plate this plate does not come off if you try to take this off you will damage the bridge internally there are four screws here that get turned about three quarters of a turn to loosen them and then there are uh, 14 15 15 screws that have to be removed to get the, just to get the top cover off three on the front this one doesn't come out three down each side three along the back and three across the center and you'll see when we get inside of here why there's so many screws right 15 screws have been removed and the four outer screws on this plate have been turned three quarters of a turn each to release the clamps on the inside now we merely slide the cover back and lift it away all right with the top cover removed we can take a look at the insides here we have a power supply with a ballast tube to keep the filament voltage stable a rectifier and a gas discharge regulator to keep the voltage the DC voltage constant this is the IF amplifier this is tuned to hundred kilohertz notice the heavy large casting aluminum casting here and when we get further into this you're gonna see how many screws are holding the cover on the side of that it's amazing this is about a quarter inch wall thickness and this is the bridge assembly with all the gear trains it's also a heavy casting that's almost three-eighths of an inch thick all the webs here are at least a quarter of an inch thick that was done for stability purposes so that there wouldn't be a lot of thermal changes as this thing warmed up and cooled down or the ambient temperature in the room changed so we have three vacuum tubes in the power supply two in the IF section the uh, the power supply is an OD3 or 0D3 uh, regulator a 5Y3 uh, full wave rectifier and a 6H-6 ballast tube that's this guy now that's not to be confused with a 6H6 which is a dual diode I understand from some of the forums people have plugged 6H6's in there and done a lot of damage to this thing this is a 6H-6 and that's a ballast tube the IF section over there uses a 6AG5. Actually, it uses a pair of 6AG5s. Inside of the bridge network itself, there's a 6AB4. And inside of the oscillator, there are two uh, 5718s. And the 5718 is one of these. Let me see if I can get a piece of paper behind it here something to let the camera focus on this is one of the oscillator tubes now this is new old stock I have four of these uh, tubes that have never been installed in anything and you notice they have wire leads hanging out the bottom these tubes are soldered directly into the oscillator unit and that's done to minimize capacitance a tube socket adds an awful lot of capacitance this unit goes all the way up to 260 megahertz that was you know UHF ultra high frequency back then and they did everything they could to reduce stray capacitance including using these special pencil tubes that have wire leads hanging out the bottom of them the reason there's two oscillator tubes inside of the oscillator assembly is they are 100 kilohertz apart 
and when you do an alignment on this unit it's a painfully long process because there are two identical oscillator sections in here and they have to track together at 100 kilohertz they're injected into the bridge and when the phase angle between the two of them balances when the bridge is balanced that's when you get the nulls the IF transformer is tuned very sharply to 100 kilohertz and that's all it looks for is 100 kilohertz you're injecting frequencies up to 260 megahertz but one of them is going to be offset by 100 kilohertz and when the bridge is unbalanced some of that 100 kilohertz is going to go through the IF section and then off to the meter that's where you get your meter reading when the bridge is balanced there's no more 100 kilohertz then the meter the null goes to zero so we'll take a closer look at some of the gears here briefly let me get another uh, few screws out of the front cover and we'll continue on after removing 11 more screws and unplugging numerous connectors and disconnecting some other miscellaneous cables we have the oscillator and bridge section out now the power supply and the IF are two separate units mounted in the rear of the unit separated by an aluminum panel to uh, prevent any signal transfer back and forth between the two units to make the unit operate as cleanly as possible and taking a look at this you begin to appreciate why this unit costs so much all of these gear trains are split gears with spring in between so they're all zero backlash that means when you go from one direction to the other you don't have any backlash in the gear train because the two gear sets are spring loaded offset against each other and take up any room or any play that might be between the worm and and the gear that's being driven here you can see the same thing over here you can probably i hope see there's two springs here those are preloading the two separate gear sections here so there's absolutely no backlash between this dr drive gear and the driven gear the same thing applies to the front remember these two oscillators have to track precisely within 100 kilohertz of each other the capacitance drive for uh, parallel capacitance same thing now the balance on the bridge is merely another capacitor so there's two very high Q capacitors mounted in here down here we have the vacuum tube for the bridge and I'll pop the cover off the end of the oscillator here but first I want to see if I can get a close-up of this uh, re reactance wheel the one that reads out your impedance and see if I can find you some of the marks that were left there from the factory Okay, I hope this comes out on the camera. This is really hard. I cannot see them in the viewfinder, but I can see them with the naked eye. But between this 35 and this 40, we should be able to make out some pencil marks. And every tick mark on here has a pencil mark next to it, or it was marked by the uh, technician before he hand engraved Oh, it looks like there's one up above. Yep, there's one for 35. There's one that stands out, I think. Ooh, just make it out. And let's see if I can get my marker in here without doing any damage. I think you can see one right there on that line there. That stands out. But there is actually one at every line above 40. It's, in other words, uh, 30, it's going, we're going in the opposite direction. So from 40 up would be 39, 38, 37, so on and so forth. All the way around, the, around this wheel, on every segment or every mark that's engraved into this wheel, there's a tiny little pencil mark where the technician had marked those and then went back and engraved them so that this thing would be in, in spec. And this is the access cover to the oscillator compartment. The other end is virtually identical, uh, except the shaft goes through uh, from that side. And you can see all the screws holding this cover on. Again, this was done to make this cover extremely thermally stable, so there was as little drift as possible. They did everything humanly possible to make this thing stable. This front panel is 3 16ths of an inch thick. 
It's an extremely thick panel. This isn't 090, it isn't 18, it's 3 16 187 thousandths thick, just to make the front rigid so there wouldn't be any flex and there wouldn't be any change in frequency when you touch the front of this unit. So let's get this cover off. Right, 19 screws and a battery change in the camera later. We have the inside of the oscillator compartment. And now notice the thick webbing between the oscillator compartments. Here's one of the vacuum tubes mounted in a little metal clamp with all of its leads hardwired into the circuit. Here's the other vacuum tube with its leads wired into the circuit. We have two glass piston trimmers. This one's for balancing the oscillators. This one's for peaking. You saw me turn that knob in the front when I was maximizing the drive. Also have glass piston trimmers on these turrets. Now these turrets do the band changing, and if I can reach around here, there's two pins, one here, one here, and I don't know if we can see those at all, probably. There's the turrets, or one of the turrets. That's for the band changes. There's coils mounted on there. You can probably see the one on that one and see the coil there. Each band change brings in a different coil, locks it into a pair of connectors up here so that the oscillator will operate on a different band segment. Then when you turn the tuning knob, you can see the two variable capacitors up here tracking one another so that the two oscillators tune or follow along and tune the same. Now, these capacitors, it's probably not evident in the camera, but these rotor plates are split. They have splits in them. There's another split there and another split there. That's done so that they can move those farther apart or push them further together because there's going to be small variations in the capacitor and a trained technician can go through there and make these two capacitors track exactly the same capacitance for a certain number of degrees of rotation. It's a long, tedious job to do it. I've done it on some old antique radios. Most radios don't even bother doing that. Back in, back in the 40s and 50s, they threw an off-the-shelf variable capacitor in there and whatever the dial tracked was good enough. But high-end equipment, a lot of times some of the high-end shortwave equipment had that same type of capacitor arrangement where you could actually go in and vary the capacitance slightly of, the, of those outside plates and make the capacitor, the, make the dial track correctly for the frequency. And believe me, it's not a simple job to do. And for the young players out there, when you remove the covers off of a unit like this, you're going to find screen inside. No, that's not to keep the mosquitoes out. That's an RF gasket. That's to keep radio frequency signals from leaking out of this cavity and getting into that IF amplifier or into the bridge because any leakage from here would affect the accu accuracy of the bridge and you'd get some uh, you'd get incorrect readings you wouldn't be able to uh, to null things correctly this is actually silver plated screen it's standard screening material probably bronze or brass I'm gonna guess but it's been silver plated so that it has high conductivity and silver oxide is actually a better conductor should this silver oxidize it's a better conductor than copper silver oxide actually will conduct better than copper while I'm putting screws back into here we've got a couple of comments to make I'm sure somebody out there is gonna say but I didn't see you unplug the unit before you started working on it of course I didn't unplug it. Where would be the challenge in that? I need all the excitement I can get. Yes, I unplugged it. Um, if you're not smart enough to unplug it, you get what you deserve. Let's throw some bleach in the gene pool. Um, it's unplugged. Everything was discharged. And the sharp-eyed out there might have noticed when I took the top cover off of this unit that there were two waxy capacitors, two of those old paper wax capacitors on top of the oscillator section. And someone's gonna say, but you said you change each and every one of those. Yes, I normally do. Those two capacitors are uh, 200 volt or probably higher than that. 
at least 200 volt rated paper capacitors and they're across the filament line that's going into the oscillator. The two big tubes or metal cylinders that were up there are feed-through capacitors and those are bypass capacitors on the filament wi uh, wires to keep any RF that makes it through the bypass capacitor to shunt that to ground. They're 200 volt caps, they're operating at 6 volts. I don't think I have a lot of worries about those going bad and causing a problem. Uh, if they were anywhere in the high voltage section, uh, I would have changed them. And for the young players out there, if you get one of these pieces of equipment and you are playing with it, as mentioned, there's AC line voltage in here as well as a couple of hundred volts of DC. Vacuum tubes run on high voltage. So have someone else around when you're playing with this stuff until you've had some experience with it. All right, all the screws are back on. Our silver screen is in place. And as AVE Bolter up there in Canada would say, that will keep all the magic pixies inside the box so that they don't leak out and escape. When I got this unit, it didn't work. This meter movement was open. And I looked high and low, and finally I got lucky on eBay and found a meter movement. It's got the same case. It had the same size opening, same size hole. It was the right uh, resistance, internal resistance. The only difference is it did it had a different pointer on it. It's got this little sad onion up here on the end of the dial. And I probably should have cut that off, but I was afraid of bending the needle. So I opened the meter movement up, re removed the uh, scale that was inside it, and took the one off the Boonton Radio Corporation meter and installed that, and was back in business. And that was all that was wrong with this unit when I got it. A quick cleanup of the contacts inside the turret so that when the band switching occurred, it was reliable, and we were in business. I checked the alignment. It was close enough for the girls I go out with, and I've been using this piece of equipment now for about six years. Probably going to move it along now that I have the vector network analyzer. It takes up a lot of bench space, and it is slow, but it's funny. When I've got a couple of coils to check, I usually run to this. I don't bother turning the computer on and getting the network analyzer all hooked up. A lot of times, I'll just run back to this guy if I want to check the reactance on something, because it's... It's simple, it's accurate, and it's kind of fun to use. And just so that we've covered all the bases, here's the bottom of the unit. This is just the plug that goes to the power supply. So that will go through the hole in the back panel and plug the power supply back in. This is the back of the meter movement, and it actually had a fuse on the meter movement. So I was kind of surprised the meter movement was open. It probably just failed. But the meter movement is actually fused. I've never seen that before. Uh, they spared no expense in here. Look at the thickness of these webs on this casting. It's incredible. The only thing I found wrong in here other than that is somebody had broken a screw off on this housing, but it doesn't hurt anything. There's plenty of others, or this cover. There's plenty of other things holding it together, and I wasn't going to try to dig that screw out of the aluminum. Um, everything in here is shielded, double shielded from the oscillator up to the bridge. It's just incredible the steps they took to make this thing uh, be as accurate and reliable as possible. And after you've been inside here and looked around you can appreciate why even in 1953 this was a $1200 unit. Okay, we've got most of the screws back in. We're going to get the rest of all these cover screws installed and see if we can uh, see if all the magic pixies inside are happy. Once that's done we'll wrap up this video and move on to something else. Sometime here in the very near future hello, oh the cover's down low there. Um, sometime here in the very near future we'll do the uh, review of the three Q meters and the tear down on those or at least on the old timer we'll do one of the old timers hmm I think if I snug this up it'll lift the cover enough to let that screw go in yep that lifted it right up and uh, we'll take a look at the inside of the Q meter 
and see if we can get some other vintage equipment to do some reviews on. So for now, I hope this was enjoyable. If you liked it, please give us a thumbs up uh, down at the bottom of the screen down there, and I'd appreciate it. And until next time, this is the Radio Mechanic. Talk to you later.